Hey, welcome back to another 10 with Ken. I'm Ken Steele. Last week, we started our countdown of the top 10 trends affecting Canadian higher education in 2015. If you missed it, check it out now. I can wait. This week, we're going to review the four remaining trends, arguably the biggest of 2015, ranging from political correctness to personal safety, and from major demographic shifts to truth and reconciliation. Let's take 10 and take a look. Looking back at 2015 to recap the countdown so far, there were steps forward and back on gender equity. Free online textbooks gained momentum. Adjunct and contingent faculty went on strike. Drones made their way into the curriculum and particularly the marketing department. The monopolies of commercial journal publishers started to feel some pressure. And presidents and board chairs across the country took some real heat on double dip compensations. Now let's take a look at the remaining four top trends that jump out at me when I look at 2015 in review. Top trend number four of 2015 was, I would say, mandatory Indigenous content in the curriculum. It's been obvious for decades that First Nations, Métis and Inuit students don't get equal economic or educational opportunities in Canada. In 2015, national attention was focused on the issue with the release of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's report on residential schools and what it labeled a government's attempt at cultural genocide. The TRC made 94 recommendations to government, higher education, churches, corporations, and the Pope himself. The TRC specifically recommended that post-secondary institutions teach credit courses, diploma and degree programs in Aboriginal languages, and urged the introduction of mandatory courses in Aboriginal issues, history and Indigenous ways of knowing to the curriculum, especially in schools of nursing, medicine, law, education and journalism. In 2015, we started to see the announcement of mandatory requirements even before the TRC report was published. In February, the University of Winnipeg Students Association and the Aboriginal Students Council jointly proposed that the university should make a course in Indigenous history or culture mandatory for all students. They identified more than 100 courses in 17 departments that could satisfy the requirement. The Senate approved the motion in principle in March for implementation as early as fall 2016. Also in February, Lakehead University announced that it would introduce Indigenous knowledge and perspectives into courses across all faculties starting in 2016. Last June, citing the TRC recommendations, UBC's Sonder School of Business and UBC Okanagan's School of Nursing both announced that they would be introducing Indigenous content into their curricula. In July, the new president at the University of Saskatchewan, Peter Stoichev, announced that he would make Indigenization his top priority. None of the rest of it matters at this point in our nation's history if we do not achieve this, he said. By December, the law faculties at UBC and Lakehead had both established mandatory courses in Aboriginal law and intercultural training. It seemed that 2015 was the year to announce mandatory Indigenous content in university programs. There's probably no safe way to talk about this, but top trend number three in 2015 appeared to be political correctness. On campus, the focus was on microaggressions and for the potential of some content to trigger post-traumatic stress for students. In a lot of ways, it's an intergenerational clash of cultures. Boomer and Gen X faculty are alarmed at any threat to academic freedom, free speech, or open intelligent debate. A student attempts to suppress political points of view, disinvite unpopular speakers, or demand trigger warnings appear to faculty like efforts at micro-totalitarianism. The growing ranks of untenured contingent faculty feel vulnerable and exposed, perhaps even afraid of their students. But their opponents see only privileged, bigoted, grumpy old white men. Generation Y students, on the other hand, have grown up with Facebook and Tumblr. Free speech can be taken for granted, but a thoughtless comment will be met with a firestorm of outrage. They will fight against oppression and prejudice, even when it's just subliminal, metaphorical, or linguistic. But to older generations, these kids today seem emotionally fragile and want to be protected from any ideas that make them uncomfortable. The two generations seem to fundamentally disagree about that old saying, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. 
Faculty associations are panicking at the prospect of mandatory trigger warnings to warn students of potentially triggering content in a course and potentially allow them to opt out of lectures or assignments. In the words of the AAUP, the presumption that students need to be protected rather than challenged in the classroom is at once infantilizing and anti-intellectual. In a 2015 cover story, the Atlantic Monthly lamented that we are coddling the American mind. Big-name comedians Chris Rock and Jerry Seinfeld chimed in, saying they no longer perform on college campuses because students can't take a joke. Michael Persinger, a controversial neuroscientist at Laurentian University, was removed from his intro psych course last December because he required students to sign a waiver indicating that his course was rated R for course language. But trigger warnings were a highlight of 2014. 2015 was much more about microaggressions, subtle, subliminal forms of racism and sexism embedded in metaphor and language, like an NFL team named the Redskins, Confederate flags flying over state legislature buildings, campus buildings named for historic white slave owners. Universities have started including microaggression awareness in orientation programs for new faculty. Some collective agreements now explicitly protect against workplace microaggressions. The University of California system issued guidelines on microaggression, including examples such as that America is the land of opportunity, which caused outrage at Fox News. Freedom of speech groups like the U.S. Foundation for Individual Rights in Education and in Canada, the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms have started ranking universities and student unions for their speech codes, misconduct policies, and suppression of free speech. Last year, 15 Canadian universities and 26 student unions received grades of F. Both sides in this culture clash are taking absolutist, idealist positions based on legitimate moral principles. I think reasonable minds ought to be able to arrive at a workable compromise, at a handful of topics that clearly deserve trigger warnings and some obvious microaggressions that need to be squashed. But the struggle for political correctness has been ongoing for three decades, and it is not over yet. 2015 was also certainly a year of sexual misconduct. A number of studies have indicated that the incidents of sexual assault are actually in decline on North American campuses, but the issue was front and center in the mainstream media last year. In November 2014, Rolling Stone magazine published an explosive expose about an alleged gang rape at a fraternity at the University of Virginia. Although Rolling Stone later retracted the story and the managing editor resigned, it sparked campus protests and fueled national outrage. Then a full-length documentary on campus sex assault hit theaters in early 2015. The hunting ground sensationalized the efforts of some Ivy League institutions to protect their brands and to protect the reputations of fraternities and sports franchises. The first few weeks, I made some of my best friends, but two of us were sexually assaulted before classes had even started. I went to the Dean of Students' office, and she said, I just want to make sure that you don't talk to anyone about this. They protect perpetrators because they have a financial incentive to do so. The problem of sexual assault on campuses is enormous. I think it's fair to say that they cover these crimes up. There's a lot of victim blaming. He lectured us about how we shouldn't go out in short skirts. They told me despite the fact that I had a written admission of guilt that what I presented to them could only prove that he loved me. They discourage them from going to the police. If it goes to the police, then it's more likely to end up as a public record. Universities are protecting a brand. They sexual assault expected. The second most common type of insurance claim against the fraternity industry is for rape. Her rapist's name matched the name of two other cases, and he was allowed back on campus. The message is clear. You're not going to win. We started seeing, you know, what was happening at campuses across the country. Hi. Hi. Hi, has no one connected the dots before? These students went from sexual assault victims to survivors and now activists. My name is Carolyn Luby. My name is Alexa Schwartz. My name is Ari Mostov. This is a national problem. We are fed up! I was getting threatened. It was working in their favor to silence me. I was terrified. I thought if I told them, they would take action, but the only action they took was against me. We've got a lot further to go. And last year, Columbia visual arts student Emma Sulkowitz 
made headlines by carrying a mattress everywhere on campus, including to her graduation, to protest the fact that her accused rapist had not been expelled. The accused, Paul Nungesser, has filed a lawsuit against Columbia for allowing her performance art project, which he called a campaign of harassment against him. In Canada, we'd already been discussing campus rape culture for a year after the scandalous orientation chants and sexist Facebook groups of 2014. The University of Ottawa had suspended its men's hockey team and fired its coach after an alleged sexual assault occurred on the road in Thunder Bay. In January, its Task Force on Respect and Equality issued 11 recommendations. In May, allegations of sexual assault swirled around Royal Military College, where two cadets faced court-martial for raping new recruits. Victims were seeking protection against expulsion or demotion. A sexual assault prevention expert reported a hostile reception on campus. In February, a CBC investigation looked at sex assault reporting numbers for 77 Canadian colleges and universities. They claimed the laughably low number of incidents suggests that institutions are either not encouraging victims to come forward or are actively covering up incidents. In fact, 16 schools reported zero sex assaults in the previous five years. Despite widely varying criteria, the CBC published its data in a ranking on its website. The headlines created public and political pressure throughout 2015. In January, the presidents of Ontario's colleges and universities unanimously agreed to review sexual assault policies in the wake of recommendations from the Ontario Women's Directorate. In March, Ontario Premier Kathleen Wynne announced a $40 million initiative to curb sexual violence and harassment. In April, Ontario's colleges all announced new standalone policies. The Association of Atlantic Universities created a working group on campus safety and sexual assault. All year long, scores of institutions across the country announced new sexual assault policies, protocols, and awareness campaigns. The importance of unambiguous affirmative consent was codified into California law in 2014, and yes means yes campaigns proliferated. Students Nova Scotia launched a more than yes campaign. In 2015, active bystander intervention programs were announced at McGill, University of Windsor, and other campuses. These programs encouraged students to intervene safely to stop acts of sexual violence. 23 post-secondary institutions in Alberta supported a provincial campaign, hashtag I Believe You, to try to encourage a better response among friends, family, and first responders when victims come forward. Bye, Mom. Be back round one. Love you. Bye, Mrs. Cook. Mom, I didn't want him to do that. I believe you, baby. The states of Virginia, California, and Maryland even considered legislation to add sexual assault sanctions to students' permanent transcripts, and smartphone apps to secure sexual consent, like Good To Go or We Consent, have been proliferating. After living through 2015 on campus, nobody has an excuse anymore for failing to understand the meaning of sexual consent. And finally, in 2015, colleges and universities across North America could no longer deny the coming of Peak Campus. A few years ago, I published a white paper predicting Peak Campus and arguing that the writing was on the wall and had been for decades. Most college and university campuses, especially those in remote northern locations, will see fewer and fewer students on campus over the next 20 years. The first wave is already here and is being driven by demographics. Youth populations are in decline almost everywhere in the country except for a handful of metropolitan centers that are also magnets for immigration. Aggressive international recruitment can serve as a short-term fix, but will hit a natural limit. Commodity programs, such as the humanities, for example, tend to draw their students locally and therefore exhibit the first signs of demographic pressure. Sure enough, in 2015, there was plenty of evidence of plateauing or even declining enrollment across North America. The National Student Clearinghouse Research Center reported that American college and university enrollments declined in 2015 for the third straight year. This was felt strongest at two-year community colleges, which saw a 6% decline and at for-profit institutions. Between 2010 and 2015, the massive University of Phoenix had lost almost a quarter million students, half of its enrollment, 
and laid off more than a thousand staff. In Canada, things were not quite so bleak, but then our employment situation had not yet recovered either. The Council of Ontario Universities tried to put a positive spin on a decline in applicants of 5% over two years. The demographic trend was inevitable, they said, although years ago they argued that increased participation rates would neutralize its effect. Of course, the pain wasn't being felt equally everywhere. Some universities saw precipitous declines, particularly those remote from the Toronto area. Lakehead and Windsor saw drops of 18 and 19 percent. But across the province, it was also clear that applications remained steady in STEM fields. We're increasing in engineering, but we're dropping sharply in the arts. Last year, the Maritime Province's Higher Education Commission reported a 1% decline in enrollments after four years of increases. But over the past decade, the number of students actually from the Maritimes declined by 16%. Since 2003, maritime institutions had increased their recruitment from the rest of Canada by 11%, and internationally by 77%. Smaller campuses in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick were struggling. Although Canadian demographics will recover somewhat in the 2020s, I think other trends will work to sustain the peak campus phenomenon well beyond that. In a previous podcast, we talked about the rise of invisible part-time students. They juggle work and home life with their studies, leverage online and hybrid delivery of courses, and spend less time physically on campus. Library collections are going digital, and simulations are going virtual. Right now, most undergraduate students still do best in face-to-face -face programs on campus. But as each generation is comprised of more and more digital natives, I have to believe we'll see steadily more virtualization of the campus experience. It may take two decades or it may take five, but there will be a lot fewer people on campus when that happens. So looking back at 2015 in review, what's it all mean? Not everything is connected, and random chance does play a role in what rises to public awareness over an arbitrary 12-month period. Working on the front lines, you may have felt that the only real change was a heavier workload and a tighter budget. But worldwide, I think we saw academic culture trying to cope with rapidly accelerating diversity in its students and its workforce. Enhanced sensitivity to subtle forms of discrimination that are nonetheless unacceptable. And the need to incorporate indigenous ways of knowing into the curriculum. Protests against the injustices of an underclass of contingent workers. Salary gaps for women extravagant benefits for presidents, and a system that sometimes leaves sex assault victims feeling silenced or shamed. We saw challenges to the profitable business models of commercial textbook and journal publishers, rapid adoption of new technologies, and gradual realization that many campuses will be struggling with enrollment for years to come. 2015 was a pretty eventful year for higher ed when you get right down to it, and I've got no reason to believe 2016 is going to be boring either. Thanks again for taking 10 with me. This countdown of the top trends of 2015 took us a bit longer to prepare than we expected, but hopefully you found it worth the wait. We'll be back next week with a roundup of the top higher ed headaches of 2015, the controversies, scandals, and incidents that are the stuff of PR nightmares. I hope you'll join us. Meanwhile, please take a moment to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, YouTube, or by email.